Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Grasp of Robotics series. Just as quick reminders, um, these and previously recorded talks can be found on our YouTube channel and website. And throughout the talk, please submit any Q&A question, any questions that you have um, through the Q&A button. These will be answered at the end of the talk um, by our panelists. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our guest faculty host for today's talk, Dr. Pratik Trahard, Assistant Professor of the Electrical and Systems Engineering Department within the School of Engineering here at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much and enjoy the talk. Thank you, uh, Gabby. Thank you, Mark. Uh, um, the new website looks very cool. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Muinat Bell. Uh, she's an assistant professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University in the departments of electrical and computer engineering, biomedical engineering, and also computer science. Uh, she founded the Pulse Lab. Pulse uh, stands for Fo Photoacoustic and Ultrasonic Systems Engineering Lab, as you see on this web page. Uh, and she works at the intersection, a very exciting intersection of uh, ultrasonic sensors, uh, machine learning, and medical imaging and surgical robotics. Uh, Dr. Bell earned her uh, BS degree in mechanical engineering with a major in biomedical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, she did her PhD at uh, Duke University, again, in biomedical engineering, and she did her postdoctoral studies uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins University after that. Uh, she's been a recipient of numerous awards, uh, the, uh, including the MIT Tech Reviews Innovators Under 35 Award, the NSF Career, uh, the NIH Trailblazer Award, the Alfred uh, the Peace Loan Research Fellowship, and many others, uh, which you'll see it on her bio. Uh, today, she's going to tell us about photoacoustic vision for surgical robots. Uh, looking forward to it uh, personally. Uh, and Dr. Bell, I will uh, let you cue from here. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction, Pratik. It is my pleasure to be here today to talk to you on this topic. And I've structured this talk to focus on the core sensing technologies that we're develop in, that we're developing in my lab to enable computer vision for surgical and interventional robots. So with this introduction and from this perspective of my research to develop this new class of systems, you can think of my research as combining optics such as the laser system shown here with acoustics such as ultrasound system hardware and software innovations with robots which can be used to control either the optical or acoustics components of our systems. And we combine these things to deliver imaging technology that will ultimately be useful for patient care. So if I have some target inside of the body that I want to image, I can use these components by transmitting light toward the target which absorbs the light, undergoes thermal expansion, and generates a sound wave that can be detected with conventional ultrasound technology to provide new types of images for diagnostic and surgical capabilities that are different from your traditional sonogram. And this new type of image is called a photoacoustic image, and it can be interleaved with your traditional ultrasound imaging to improve the overall experience. And as an outline of this talk, I will give you some background into photoacoustic imaging and then transition into how it can be used for surgical and interventional guidance, and particularly guidance with assistance from robots. And then I'll follow this by details on how we're integrating deep learning and also taking advantage of coherence-based beamforming. And then I'll end with a summary and outlook. So this initial pressure distribution that is generated from the photoacoustic effect is governed by this equation, which says that initial pressure P sub naught is equivalent to the optical absorption of the target in the body, mu sub A, multiplied by the Grunison parameter, which tells us about the thermal properties of the target, multiplied by the laser fluence, which is defined as the laser energy divided by area. So if I have a sufficient quantity of any one of these parameters, I'm going to generate that initial pressure distribution, and then I can sense it with my traditional ultrasound transducer, which from this point forward works very similar to, or similarly to the ultrasound imaging system where the hardware probe contains an array of piezoelectric elements that convert the mechanical pressure wave that is sensed into electrical signals. 
And then those signals are sent to a scanner to receive the signals and send them to an onboard computer for processing. And the first step in the processing chain is called the beamforming step. And you can think of beamforming as the first line of software defense against a poor quality image. After beamforming, the signals undergo some more post-processing, such as log compression, filtering, and scan conversion. And then the photoacoustic image would be ready for display on the monitor. And just to bring this concept home a little further as to why we're using photoacoustics, despite the wide array of imaging techniques that already exist, such as X-ray, CT, ultrasound, and MRI, we're using photoacoustic imaging because it exploits a different tissue property in comparison to these other imaging techniques. And that is the property of optical absorption, that mu sub A that you saw in the expression on the previous slide. So generally, photoacoustic images are beneficial for targeting any structure that has a higher optical absorption than its surroundings. So this is true of blood vessels, metal implants, or contrast agents that may be injected into the body. And so we can see that photoacoustic imaging has this potential to provide new information for surgical guidance. And on top of that, it shares many of the same benefits as ultrasound. For first of all, it uses similar hardware. And then on top of that, it is safe like ultrasound is. It doesn't require ionizing radiation. It could be portable and it offers real time information. So from a historical perspective, photoacoustic imaging has made an impact and has shown remarkable promise in several applications, such as small animal imaging or superficial vessel imaging, as well as molecular imaging or intravascular imaging. The common system design among these applications is to attach light delivery systems to the ultrasound hardware or to have the light located at a fixed distance from the hardware the sound reception hardware. The novelty introduced by my lab breaks this rigidity in system design and adds more flexibility by separating the light source from the acoustic receiver and instead attaching it to surgical tools. And one reason we do this is because the optical absorption of metal is high. So you can appreciate that in this lower left image where we see the photoacoustic image of a stent embedded within a vessel. And so just like we could see this metal stent, we could also see the metal surgical tooltip and its relationship to underlying vasculature during surgery, similar to the way we can see the underlying vasculature in the palm of that person's hand in the top center. And then we want to use this information to provide surgeons with the level of detail they need to avoid accidental injury to major blood vessels during surgery, which could be very catastrophic and could potentially lead to patient death. The first working prototype for this concept was demonstrated by my lab for neurosurgery. We built a specialized light delivery system that you see me holding here, and it surrounds a neurosurgical drill. And we have this mock surgical environment where the two black lines that you see represent the two internal carotid arteries. When this prototype enters the mock surgical field, we see the tooltip and its relationship to the mock arteries in the accompanying photoacoustic image. This result gives us the confidence we need to correlate what we see in the photoacoustic image with what is actually taking place in the surgical field. But in a real surgical environment, the major structures that we want to avoid are hidden. So we added a layer of bone to increase the complexity of our mock surgical field. And in doing this, we see that the same information is present. Basically, we see in the photoacoustic image that we would want to avoid and not drill when the, the drill tip is located next to a major vessel, or we would simply um, only proceed when there's no vessel in the image. So let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture for this prototype design, which was developed for minimally invasive surgery that is performed through the nose to remove pituitary tumors. Our proposed design features flexible fiber probe separation. As you see here, the light delivery system is attached to the neurosurgical drill. And this design would allow us to transmit light to the surgical site and generate a photoacoustic effect 
that propagates a sound wave toward an externally placed ultrasound probe. This design you can appreciate requires both optical and acoustic engineering. On the optical side of things, the engineering can be studied with optical simulation software that tells us details about light profile sizes and optimal placement for the optical fiber relative to a tool shaft. We can also use simulations to determine how far fibers should be set back from the tool tip, how many fibers we should use, or what the profile would look like as a function of distance from the tissue surface, which is exactly what you see here in these simulations. And then the sample photographs on the right show us that we get nice confirmation that the dimensions and the shape of the light being produced matches what our simulation tells us should happen. And I mentioned on the previous slide that our designs require innovations in both optics and acoustics. And you may have noticed that the acoustic receiver was placed on the temporal region of the skull, which was the initial proposal for this idea. After additional exploration, we learned that the temporal region is not the only possible location for this system design. We came to this conclusion based on a series of simulation ex and experiments performed with the same cadaver skull, which you see a 3D reconstruction of here. Now you're seeing the result of an acoustic K-wave simulation of a photoacoustic source placed within the location of the internal carotid arteries that we want to avoid. Then external receivers were distributed around the skull and the maximum pressure sensed by each receiver is represented by the colors that you see. From this simulation result, we see that there are additional possible ultrasound probe placements based on the location of the maximum pressure. And those locations are the eyes and the nose. We validated the simulation results with the experimental setup shown here using the same cadaver skull that was simulated. And the commonality among these setups is that we have an optical fiber in the nose to illuminate the location of the internal carotid arteries. And then we have acoustic receivers placed at varying locations identified by the simulations. The first is the initially proposed temporal region of the skull. The second is the newly identified nasal region shown in the upper right. And the bottom images show the ultrasound receiver placed on the newly identified ocular region both in the absence and presence of eyes that were inserted into the skull. From this experimental setup, we obtain the images that you see here where the photoacoustic images are shown in color overlaid on the grayscale CT images. These, this co-registration of results shows us that the signals that we get with our photoacoustic systems match very well with the locations of the right and left internal carotid arteries. This combination of simulations and experiments also highlights a new possibility of performing patient-specific simulations to determine optimal probe placement prior to the initiation of a surgery. This can be done for multiple surgeries as featured here and explored by my lab. I will not have time to discuss all of these pop possible applications, but I do want to draw your attention to two of our publications that prominently demonstrate future possibilities for robots with photoacoustic sensing capabilities. The first is our pioneering publication that marks the Pulse Lab as the first in the world to integrate photoacoustic imaging with the DaVinci robot. And the second is our pioneering publication on photoacoustic-based robot-assisted biopsies. So for the remainder of this talk, I'll share several ideas surrounding these two contributions. With regard to the da Vinci robot, this concept was the first to show us that we can apply photoacoustic imaging to robotic surgeries and assist with these procedures, just like we could in freehand procedures. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the robot, but for those who are not, the surgeon sits at a master console and the subtle motions of the surgeon's hands translate to motions of the robot arms, which are holding surgical tools that are inserted through keyhole-like incisions into the patient. Our goal is to bring in a miniaturized photoacoustic imaging system to perform photoacoustic guided surgery by attaching a specialized light delivery system to any one of the da Vinci tools. And here is an example of what the surgeon sees when looking through the master console 
and sweeping the surgical tool that's surrounded by one of our specialized light delivery systems around the surgical workspace to determine where to make an incision. The inset shows the corresponding photoacoustic images. And from this example, we see that there are photoacoustic signals in one region and no photoacoustic signals when the surgeon moves away from that region. Now we developed this concept for guidance of hysterectomies, which is one of the most commonly performed procedures with the da Vinci robot. This procedure is performed to remove the uterus and it requires severing of the major blood supply to the uterus, which are the uterine arteries shown in yellow, while keeping the, ur while keeping the ureter, excuse me, I messed that up. So the uterine arteries are shown in red and we wanna sever the uterine arteries shown in red while keeping the ureter, which is shown in yellow, intact in order to preserve urinary function. One challenge with this surgery is accidental injury to the ureters shown in yellow, and we are exploring photoacoustic image guidance to overcome this challenge. And this is a challenge because you can see how closely uh, separated the ureters are from the uterine arteries, and in some cases, they overlap. So we're also exploring the concept of mapping the information provided by photoacoustic imaging to an auditory output as requested by one of our surgeon collaborators. And I'll show you an example of this concept on the next slide, but if you have an aversion to somewhat gory images, then you might wanna turn your head for this next slide. So here's an example result showing the auditory mapping demonstrated with a human cadaver during an open surgery. The ureter in this case is filled with contrast agent methylene blue and the tool tip is made of metal. So we can see both of these structures in the photoacoustic image. And then we can measure the distance between these two structures appearing in the photoacoustic image and map that distance to a sound whenever the sound is below a certain predefined threshold. And here's what it sounds like. And my, my PowerPoint crashed. So I'm going to restart and play that video for you again. And those who were there prior to my seminar knows that I tested this video out and it did not crash back then. Okay, so I believe we are where we left off. And I was in the middle of trying to show you the cool mapping of the distance to the, the sound. And here it is. So you see that when the distance measurement is below our predefined threshold, you hear an auditory sound. And with this contribution, the surgeon doesn't have to rely on solely looking at images through that master console in order to determine proximity to a major structure. So we see that there is a wide range of possibilities from visual to auditory cues that can be used to deliver information for robot assisted surgical guidance. And these possibilities all rely on our ability to successfully generate proximity information based on photoacoustic data. Moving on to our second contribution of an ultrasound guided biopsy, where the goal is to extract a small piece of tissue through a needle, it is often helpful to visualize the needle tip and the structure being extracted in the same image. We have a mechanism to do this with the assistance of ultrasound today, but some patients produce very clear images of the needle tip and target as shown on the left, and other patients do not, as shown on the right. 
So ideally we would want to know with confidence and at all times and for all patients where the needle tip and target are located, offering some sort of real-time feedback that's easy to interpret, similar to the information shown here for the needle tip. And we would want similar feedback available for the target as well. For the needle tip, we can do this by inserting an optical fiber into the hollow core of the biopsy needle and implementing photoacoustic imaging. We can then combine photoacoustic imaging capabilities with the ultrasound guidance that is already provided and take this entire concept a step further by attaching a robot arm to the ultrasound probe in order to relieve the operator for searching or in order to relieve the operator from searching for the ultrasound and photoacoustic signals. And we tested this concept for photoacoustic signals in a controlled experimental environment, resulting in our photoacoustic based visual servoing system that visual servos a needle tip. And the needle is attached to a translation stage and houses an optical fiber in this demonstration. And the translation stage is used to advance the needle into tissue while the robot held ultrasound probe is tasked with maintaining sight of the needle tip. Then if we're nowhere near our biopsy target, we can overtake the robot and, it's the, and then release, and then it's the robot's job to find the needle tip again. And if we look at the photoacoustic images that are produced, which are shown on the right, and the segmentation of the photoacoustic images are shown on the left with the green line representing the image center, we see that the task to, to center the needle tip is successfully performed, but there are also artifacts in the photoacoustic image that are associated with the needle tip, but they're not associated with the location of the needle tip. So this demonstration allows us to appreciate three possible automation tasks for performing a combination of ultrasound and photoacoustic guided biopsies. The first task is automated needle tip detection with no possible confusion from reflection artifacts that can appear in the photoacoustic image. For this task, we categorize the needle tip signal as a point source and we detect it with photoacoustic imaging. The second task is fully automated ultrasound biopsy detection, which means that we would no longer have to overtake the robot to manually find this target. And for demonstration purposes, we're going to simplify our biopsy detection problem into that of detecting a single cyst surrounded by tissue. The third task is to improve the visibility of both the needle tip and the biopsy target with advanced coherence based beam forming. And the specific novelty enabled by deep learning in this particular task is the possibility for an improvement in the speed with which we can deliver this advanced beamforming method. We also have possibilities to improve the other two tasks with deep learning, and we'll understand in the next few slides why this is a possibility to enable both point source and cyst detection in support of my larger vision for a fully autonomous biopsy system. To understand the potential of deep learning with regard to point source detection, let's start by visualizing a wavefront propagating outward spherically from a point source, which as a reminder is representative of our needle tip. This, this source, this wavefront is recorded by our ultrasound probe producing channel data that looks like this. And our goal is to beamform this channel data into an image that looks like the source that created the recording. But when we apply today's beamformers, as you saw in the video, and as you see here from the simulation result, we don't exactly get that nice circular point. The shape that we see can be distorted, the point can appear at an incorrect depth, and we have artifacts in the image to the left and right of the source. One reason we see these deviations from what we expect is because of a fundamental flaw in the beamforming process, which makes assumptions about wave propagation that, is, that are not always true. For example, when we beamform our signals, we assume that the speed of sound is constant, but we know that the speed of sound can vary between two different patients, and it also varies within the multiple tissues we have in our body. Another assumption that we make that's not true is that we have no reflection or no reflectors in our field. So we assume that there's an absence of multiple um, wave propagation. And here's a nice simulation to demonstrate why exactly that's a problem. So here in this simulation, we have a photoacoustic source representative of our needle tip, and we have some reflector in the field that has a high acoustic impedance, such as the bone within our body. And when our wavefront from the source, the needle tip, 
propagates outward spherically and encounters that reflector, notice how a second wave front is produced. And when we get the recorded signals, we see the data on the left, the channel data on the left. And then when we beamform the signals in the red box, we get the image that you see on the right, which has a source and an artifact. And because we saw the simulation that created this image, we know exactly where the source and the artifact came from. So now this effect of reflection artifacts is easy to appreciate when there's a single point source for photoacoustic imaging and a single reflector. But the same thing happens in ultrasound imaging with the caveat being that the wave fronts are typically more complicated. However, the same principles hold in that the underlying signals look significantly different in the presence of reflection artifacts. So we can think of artifacts as the mapping of signal sources to the wrong location. And our goal with deep learning is to map signal sources to the correct location. And we do this by inputting channel data and creating a network that has three outputs for the photoacoustic simulation. The first is a classification of the detected wavefront as either a source or an artifact. The second is a confidence score associated with that classification. And the third is a bounding box location, as you see in the example movie at the bottom of this slide. This bounding box tells us the location of our true sources, and we know that it's a true source because we're taking advantage of the physics of wave propagation, which says that true sources that are located closer to a receiver will have a different wavefront shape from sources that are located farther away, which take longer to propagate and have an expansion of that radius of curvature. And so what we believe we're doing is taking advantage of modern computer vision techniques to identify these patterns and relate them to the correct depth. And we have the ground truth because we simulate it. And then after training our networks with simulated data, the ultimate test of any of these networks is how they perform on real data, which in this case we obtained by inserting an optical fiber into the hollow core of a cardiac catheter. And that catheter was then inserted into an in vivo vein. Now you can't see the vein or the catheter in this very noisy and poor quality ultrasound image, but you can see multiple wave fronts in the corresponding photoacoustic channel data. We then passed this photoacoustic data through our network and formatted the three outputs to produce a clearer indication of where the catheter tip is located. We can also display the output by itself, which we call our CNN based image. And we can compare the CNN result to the poor resolution results achieved with more traditional beamforming and immediately appreciate the benefits. Now, this result provides evidence that the method will produce the same benefits for needle tip detection, although we tested it in a catheter. So moving on to the second task of biopsy target detection, which we simplify to a task of assist detection to demonstrate feasibility with deep learning. We train with simulations that mimic physics of wave propagation, this time the physics of ultrasound wave propagation rather than a photoacoustic wave propagation. And remember this propagation is significantly more complicated. Nonetheless, we were able to model a single cyst surrounded by tissue and we have a one plane wave transmission and a single insonification angle. And we chose this transmission sequence because it is the most rapid method to acquire ultrasound data today. So if we can get our networks to work on this data, this has the greatest benefits for improving this automated detection in a real-time manner. We then varied multiple simulation parameters as listed here and shown in the diagram on the right. The values and increment sizes are now shown for the cyst radius, the sound speeds, and the position of the cyst in the axial and lateral dimensions. We then created a simulated test set that was not included during training as listed here. We then applied a range of different networks and training methods in order to produce our desired results. So unfortunately, deep learning is not an exact science, so it did take some trial and error for us to get what we ultimately desired. The gray text on this slide denotes what we improved upon as we built new networks, and the black text highlights our initial innovations or details that remain the same in comparison to previous papers on the topic. 
So more details on these networks are available in any one of these six publications and summarized on this slide. But I'll now focus on this one paper highlighted in, with the black outline. So in this paper, we published this network architecture that you see here, which was trained with simulations that model the physics of ultrasound wave propagation. And then similar to the photoacoustic network, the ultimate test of this network is also to determine how well it performs on in vivo data. And this time the in vivo data came from a patient treated at the Johns Hopkins Hospital for a suspicious breast mass. This network takes as input the raw channel data, which you can appreciate how much more complicated it is from this image on the left. And then we have two outputs with four benefits. The first is a more interpretable DNN image compared to the ground truth image that the raw data would otherwise produce as shown over here. The second benefit is that we reduce the acoustic clutter in comparison to the beamformed image, meaning that regions that should appear black actually appear black. And in this case, it's the cyst. We also have a spatial smoothing effect of, our surround, of the tissue surrounding the cyst in comparison to the ground truth beamformed image. And that's because we don't wanna confuse our robot that is tasked with finding this one target. So our goal with this network is to emphasize structures of interest, in this case, the cyst, and de-emphasize the structures that the robot would not care about when trying to find that structure. And in this case, for us, it's the surrounding tissue texture because ultrasound images are known to contain this granular tissue texture known as speckle. So we wanna get rid of that texture because we don't need it for an automated detection task. The fourth and final benefit is that we can produce a simultaneous DNN segmentation from the raw channel data as a simultaneous output with the image that's produced. And typically, for those familiar with deep learning and, and as it's applied to the ultrasound, historically, the deep neural networks have been applied to, say, this beamformed image, and then we would segment the image to find the cis. But what we're doing that's new and different is that we're saying, input the raw data, it contains all the information, output an image, and simultaneously output a segmentation. And then if we compare our DNN segmentation output, which is shown here on the left and also shown in red on the right, and we compare it to the uh, ground truth segmentation, which is shown in the background on the right, we see that the segmentation output has good agreement compared to the ground truth images, which we measure as a 0.77 dissimilarity coefficient. So we're very encouraged by the totality of these results. And if you'd like to know more, I refer you to this publication at the bottom of the slide. And now I want to switch gears and talk about how deep learning can improve that third task of the speed of delivering computationally intensive advanced beamformers. So this is the third task for the automation of the biopsy procedure that I mentioned. And it's motivated by our ability to improve the short lag spatial coherence beamformer that I created as a graduate student. To implement this beamformer, I would start with the same raw channel data that you've been seeing up until now as the input to our deep neural networks. And I would first have to apply the traditional beamforming step of delaying that data to account for time of arrival differences. And then in order to get the SLSC image, I would window that data in time and apply cross correlation calculations in space in order to build up this spatial coherence function, which is a measure of spatial coherence on the y-axis as a function of lag, which is measured in terms of the separation between two channels. And that measurement appears on the x-axis. We can then integrate this spatial coherence function up to a specific short lag value m, and then that integral is one pixel in the SLSC image. We can repeat this process for multiple depths throughout the raw channel data, and we can also repeat for multiple transmissions. And I contrast this process, which also reduces acoustic clutter, with the method that I talked about on the previous slide, the end-to-end -end deep learning approach, which reduces acoustic clutter and has the other benefits that we discussed. And we can see from this contrast that the correlation step is the most time intensive step for the advanced beamforming method that I created. And so we can think about how we can speed up this advanced method by replacing the correlation calculation step with a deep neural network. And we demonstrated this potential using our newly 
created coherent architecture that you see here. And now we have two different paths for creating this more advanced beam forming or this advanced beam formed image. The first is to take the top route, which is the traditional route introduced that I introduced as a graduate student. And we would get our original SLSC image of a breast mass shown here. And then the other option is to take this second path, take this detour and produce the DNN SLSC image. And when we do this for multiple images, we get a 0.93 image to image correlation over our entire test set. And we also achieve our goal of speeding up the image and we get a network that achieves a processing speed that's 3.4 times faster than the original approach. It's also notable that the DNN approach has greater fidelity to the original algorithm when compared to the shortcuts that are taken to implement this algorithm on a GPU. That being said, we still implemented the algorithm on a GPU for photoacoustic data just to demonstrate the capabilities for our um, visual servoing system. And this is supposed to be a video, but it doesn't seem to be playing. So I wonder if I'm still with you. Can someone yeah. give me? Okay. okay. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, so it seems like my videos are not playing, but I'm glad you're still with me. I'm glad I didn't drop off or something. Okay, so unfortunately, let's see if I can get this to play. Okay, good. So great, we got it to play. And so what we see from this um, video demonstration is that we can compare the coherence-based approach on the right which does a beautiful job of centering our, in this case, it's a fiber tip in the image. And when we compare that to our traditional amplitude-based beamformers, which we, I've talked about up until now, the system fails, particularly when the laser energy is too low. And the reason why we care about low laser energies is because they mean that we can use smaller, more miniaturized laser systems, which are more ideal for use in the operating room or the interventional suite. And so with this approach in mind and backing up a little bit to tell you that this slide shows some of my earlier work exploring the coherence-based SLSC approach to photoacoustic data, these results demonstrate that as a function of laser energy, we're able to get more benefits with the coherence-based approach than we can get with the traditional amplitude-based approach. And from these early results, I understood the potential of using low energy lasers, which are smaller and more portable for using the operating room or interventional suites to provide, the, but, they, but they have the challenge of, of offering this low signal amplitude that fails for the traditional amplitude delay in sum or DAS approach and I've shown in the paper describing our deep neural networks that there is a point where the amplitude information can be so low that the deep neural networks fail as well. So I recognize the benefit of combining these lasers with coherence based beam forming to improve target visibility. And in summary, from my perspective, in order to get this to work, there were some unexplainable trends. And so spatial coherence theory existed for ultrasound and served as the basis for the SLSC beamforming method that I developed. And then it was tested by multiple groups with experimental data for ultrasound imaging. And then in parallel, as a postdoc, I applied the spatial coherence photoacoustic imaging method to experimental data, but the same theory did not work for photoacoustics. So after returning to the fundamental principles and the physics as an assistant professor, my graduate student and I arrived at the expression that you see now in the blue box, which can be compared to the ultrasound spatial coherence theory above the blue box. And we see that both represent a Fourier transform. If you look closely, you'll notice that. And when we compare these two expressions, the ultrasound expression, it relies on a transmit ultrasound beam H but you know now that there is no transmit ultrasound beam in photoacoustic imaging. So what we had to do was create this additional phase term that accounts for the received beam staring. And this comparison 
is now what allows me to understand some of those previously unexplainable trends. And it also indicates that there are additional terms to exploit for coherence-based photoacoustic image optimization. And I'll talk a little bit about those trends by first describing to you how the expression in the blue box was derived. We did this by starting with photoacoustic spatial covariance, which is defined as the correlation of the pressure field at two lateral receiving positions, X1 and X2. And then the acoustic pressure measured from a photoacoustic target can be modeled as a random distribution of spatially incoherent absorbers multiplied by the initial pressure distribution at the absorber surface, which can exist both in the absence and presence of a scaled noise term N sub A. And then we multiply that with the model of spherical wave propagation from the source to a point on the receiver. And then after deriving the math, we get this expression, which says that the photoacoustic spatial coherence is equal to this phase term multiplied by the Fourier transform of an initial pressure distribution squared plus some scaled noise term. This expression can be considered as the Van sitter zernike theorem applied to photoacoustics. And this is the first time that this theorem has been related to photoacoustic imaging. And for those of you not familiar with this theorem, it's a theorem that relates the coherence of any incoherent source to the Fourier transform of that source. And in this case, the requirement for an incoherent source is satisfied by newly recognizing that the photoacoustic target can be modeled as a random distribution of spatially incoherent absorbers. This model can then be applied both in the presence and absence of noise to predict spatial coherence functions. And here are some example predictions in blue compared to the K-wave simulation measurements in red and compared to experimental measurements which are shown in yellow. The x-axis shows the spatial lag between two receiving points presented as a percentage of the receive aperture, and the y-axis shows the spatial coherence either predicted by theory or measured by uh, simulated or experimental data. And this result makes sense from the Fourier transform expression on the previous slide. This is one of the previously unexplainable trends, but now it makes sense because we know that just from a, a property of a Fourier transform is that, well, first, before I tell you the property, I want you to know that the, um, the lag dimension that you see on this slide, it can also be related to the spatial frequency dimension in that Fourier transform expression. And with that knowledge, now we know the property that wider in space means shorter in spatial frequency. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the smaller target, it has a fairly long coherence length and the larger target has a smaller coherence length. And if you're not familiar with the term coherence length, it's the distance up to the first zero crossing, which also defines our short lag region. And this is also a region that we had to redefine for photoacoustic imaging because of this relationship that is not as prevalent in ultrasound images. And so with this understanding, we now can understand how we integrate these co uh, coherence functions within the short lag region to generate one pixel in the SLSC image, just like we did for ultrasound imaging. But how exactly do we transition from a spatial coherence function to an SLSC image? Well, the left plot shows lag as a percentage of the receive aperture on the x-axis with the predicted and measured spatial coherence shown for multiple positions along one lateral line in the image space dimension. And the theoretical predictions are shown in blue compared with the experimental data shown in yellow. And after integrating each coherence function over the short lag region, we get the lateral profile shown on the right. And the dashed line on the right represents the specific location in the image space that produced the corresponding spatial coherence function. So taking this approach, we get a lateral profile that reveals a coherent point target, which is the same kind of point target that we want to see when imaging the needle tip for the automated biopsy system. And now we're seeing images that we get when this process is repeated, not only across the lateral space, but for multiple axial depths. And if we return to the coherence functions on the left for a minute, we now have the understanding to appreciate that the highest spatial coherence occurs at the target center. And we have lower spatial coherence anywhere off axis from the target. We can also appreciate that our theory matches experimental data very well, particularly at lower spatial lags. 
And after creating the images like the ones you see on the right, these images can actually be used to compare and measure to compare and measure contrast in theoretical and experimental images. And that's one of the beauties of this theory. I'm going to show you some examples of what I mean by that uh, for this type of comparison. But before I do, I want to show you another trend that was initially unexplainable, but follows now it follows nicely from the mathematical theory. So the new understanding that we have now which was enabled by our theory, is that the light profile size also impacts the spatial coherence measurements. And to show this, here we are seeing the predicted spatial coherence functions in the absence of noise for multiple target sizes, which are represented by the different colors. On the left, we perform our prediction based on theory for a light sheet that illuminates the entirety of each photoacoustic target. And the x-axis again shows the spatial lag between the two receiving points presented as a percentage of the receive aperture. And the y-axis shows the predicted spatial coherence. And we see in this case that the coherence length gets smaller and smaller as target sizes get larger for this light sheet illumination. But when we shrink the light profile to a Gaussian beam, which we see on the right, we see that initially the similar, a similar trend exists, but only up until the point where the Gaussian beam size is similar to the target size. And then after this point, the coherence length is dictated by the size of the light beam and multiple coherence functions for the different target sizes then start to overlap each other. So now we can see how we can use predictions and experimental results to measure contrast as I promised. And we make these uh, theoretical measurements in the presence of noise. And that's why we have the large variation shown by the shaded regions. And the x-axis shows the target diameter and the y-axis shows contrast measured initially with a light sheet shown in gray, and then the light profile size was reduced to a five millimeter Gaussian beam with the results shown in blue, and then a three millimeter, excuse me, three millimeter Gaussian beam with the results shown in red. And the data points show the experimental measurements, which overall match fairly well with theory. And I believe we are supposed to end at 1150, is that correct? Uh, that's okay. You can go on for a few minutes if you want. Okay, so let me wrap this up a little bit. I'm very excited to tell you about this, but let's give you the highlights. Is that basically decreasing the light profile size allows us, allows us to increase the SLSC image contrast. And what we can also do is look at target diameter on the x-axis and then measure the full width at half maximum on the y-axis. And ideally, there would be a one-to-one -one relationship. And so we see that the largest light source has the closest representation to the ideal line. And then as the size of the light profile decreases, the measurements start to deviate from ideal. So this result tells us that we can improve boundary delineation with a larger light profile. However, we saw on the previous slide that decreasing the light profile size increases the contrast. So this means that we have a trade-off between target contrast and boundary delineation when adjusting light profile sizes. But we can resolve this trade-off by using a smaller light beam to improve contrast and then scanning across the target to see the full boundary. And then I'll make one final point about these results, which were obtained in the absence of optical scattering. Although we know that the light uh, scatters in tissue, we can still maintain some control over the light beam size and limit this optical scattering by placing targets as close to the structure of interest as possible, which you saw earlier in our slides is our main approach to light delivery for photoacoustic guided surgery and photoacoustic guided robotic systems. So now we have this nice theory and we can use it for three things in the world of surgical guidance and surgical robotics. First, we can explore how light profile designs affect SLSC image contrast and resolution in a purely simulation environment. So typically we would have to build multiple prototypes as you see on the left and perform experiments with them as described in these three papers on the right. And now we have a simulation environment to short circuit this requirement. The second benefit is that we can use our theory to enhance tooltip contrast in photoacoustic images for surgical guidance by optimizing which lag we integrate up to. So technically we know our tooltip size. So with a light profile that is either larger or smaller than the tooltip, we will be able to predict the expected spatial coherence lengths and use that to our advantage to maximize tooltip contrast when performing the integration of to, to create SLSC images, the integration of the coherence functions. And the third 
benefit is that we can use our theory to improve photoacoustic based robotic visual serving methods. We saw earlier how this system helps both in terms of an automated biopsy and more generally when we want to use this concept to miniaturize our laser systems for use in the operating room or interventional suite. And then although I've discussed this theory in the context of SLSC imaging, we can apply and extend it to any photoacoustic method that utilizes spatial coherence. And in closing, I wanna leave you with the thought that this concept of photoacoustic guided surgery has a bright future. It's been featured in several technical and media news outlets. It's been the source of a considerable amount of funding for my lab. And it's been the topic and the reason for several young investigators awards that I've won with the most recent being the SBIE Early Career Achievement Award. And if you would like to know more, I direct your attention to these two invited publications. One is an invited perspective that I published in the Journal of Applied Physics last year. And the second is an invited conference pa proceedings paper for my invited talk at the IEEE International Ultrasonic Symposium last year. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that my research combines optics, acoustics, and robotics to engineer novel imaging systems that address unmet needs for patient care. And now at the end of my talk, I want to leave you with the thought that we do this by following this unending cycle where we develop theories and use models and simulations like the ones shown here to design novel beam formers and imaging probes such as the specialized side firing light delivery system shown here. We then use these designs interchangeably between ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging systems to build and test prototypes with the ultimate goal of improving both ultrasound and photoacoustic image quality. And then we integrate these unique prototypes with commercially available system components, such as a laser, an ultrasound machine, or a robot. And this integration results in a novel imaging system that's the first of its kind to be tested and interfaced with patients treated at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. We might then learn something from our clinical studies that would require us to revisit our theories, models, and simulations, and then the cycle continues from there. And so some concluding thoughts are that optimizing photoacoustic images for surgical guidance requires innovations in both the light delivery method and the beam forming method. I've shown you how a well-developed theory can fuel our innovation. We successfully created this theory for photoacoustic spatial coherence and we have a ways to go to get to this theoretical point for the deep learning approaches. I've shown you how several surgeries can be impacted by these advances. And I've also shown you how robotic surgical tasks will inherently benefit from these advances. And then finally, in honor of February being Black History Month, I have a few thoughts I'd like to leave with you in this regard. First, by sitting through my presentation today, you just heard Black History in the making. And second, I want to raise awareness about this paper that I co-authored with several outstanding faculty across the nation. We shed light on the funding disparity with NIH, and I encourage everyone to read it, digest the contents, and reflect on what we each want our role to be in this historic moment in time. I cannot end this presentation without saying thanks to my dedicated team of students and collaborators who have helped to make all of this possible. Thanks to my funding sources for believing in our ideas and supporting this work. Visit my lab website, pulselab.jhu.edu for more details. Follow me on Twitter for real-time updates of our work. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Minat, for such an exciting talk. Uh, so, uh, uh, here is how we can do uh, the question and answer session. So uh, Rang Wang Wang, who is a PhD student in the electrical engineering department, uh, will be the student anchor. And I will kind of uh, uh, follow him when he asks questions. Uh, we've curated some questions for you from the broader grass community uh, over the last week. Uh, there, are, there is a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, which uh, uh, we will we would love to get your insights upon. Uh, so, Rongguang, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Rongguang Wang, and I'm a second year PhD student in ESC, and uh, I work with uh, Professor uh, Prati Chaudhary and uh, Professor Christos Davitsikos, and uh, we work on the uh, how to improve uh, how to increase uh, the generalization ability uh, of deep learning algorithm. 
uh, which applied on a, some like heterogeneous medical data, which suffers from distribution shift. And uh, I think we have some questions from the audience. First one is that, uh, what is the uh, spatial resolution needed by the transductor to capture the uh, vibrations generated by the light source? That's a great question. So we use the same ultrasonic frequencies that would be used to image the human body. These frequencies are on the order of megahertz. Excuse me. And the, the range is somewhere between one megahertz for these like transcranial applications where we need the lower spatial frequencies to transmit through bone um, to the, the mm, as high as like 10 or 12 megahertz. And with these frequencies, they actually set our spatial resolution. And so our spatial resolution within these frequencies is on the order of uh, sub millimeters, like 0.1 to 0.3 millimeters or so. And um, the one caveat being that you can go to higher spatial frequencies, but there's a known trade-off between the higher frequency that you can go to, which will provide higher resolution, and the depth with which the sound can penetrate to be received by this um, higher frequency ultrasound probe. And I guess uh, you could potentially increase the depth by increasing the power, or I guess, uh, uh, is that true? That is true. Like, so there is, you know, just like for all for uh, photoacoustic imaging, increasing the input energy source, and in, in that case, it's the laser, it increases the amplitude of the photoacoustic wavefront. Um, so you can increase the laser power. And similarly, if you're thinking about it from an ultrasound perspective, you can increase the ultrasound power as well, like the in initial input energy. But in both cases, we are putting energy into the body. And so we need to be concerned about our safety limit because we don't want to destroy our tissues in the process. So there's a, you can increase the energy, but only up until a, a certain point. And then also, even with that increase, the, the, the ultrasound, when it interacts with our tissue, it's still going to attenuate, whether it's both for a photoacoustic image or an ultrasound image as it's being received, like the, the distance between the source and the receiver, as the sound is traveling that distance, there is going to be some attenuation of the sound wave and you cannot prevent that process from happening even if you maximize your, your input energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to follow up on that a tiny bit, uh, uh, what is the amount of energy that you, uh, uh, that these devices think is safe? So especially for applications like neurosurgery where there is so little energy you can pump in, right? That's a great question because, um, so the field, right, historically, when we apply lasers to the human body, it's historically been applied on the outside. So we have limits for lasers in contact with eyes and with our skin, but we actually don't have any limits for lasers in contact with all of the internal contents of our body that we are concerned with for photoacoustic guided surgery. So that's actually one thrust area of my lab that I didn't discuss. We are actually looking at redefining safety limits, or I should say creating safety limits for tissue, for lasers in contact with tissues other than skin or eyes. But until we have that, we go by the limits for eyes and skin because they're fairly conservative limits and accepted in the field that if you're within these limits, it's most likely going to be safe within the, uh, for the contents of the human body. So I say all of that, you know, as a caveat, and then I'll tell you, you know, the, the limits for the skin are on the order of say, you know, they go in terms of fluence. It's actually a fluence limit. So it's the energy divided by area. And it's defined based on not only the energy, but also the wavelength of the light that you're transmitting. And so I have to talk about limits in terms of those parameters. So. For most of the work that I showed, we used something like 750 nanometer wavelength light. And the fluence limit for that wavelength is on the order of 20 to 30 millijoules per centimeter squared. And then if we go and wanna go to higher wavelengths, like one of the primary wavelengths of the laser source that we use is um, 1064 nanometers. And then we can go to a higher limit of 100 millijoules per centimeter squared. And you know those are the limits for skin. And then what we find though is that our technique in order to get some of the images that we see, we actually have to exceed those limits in order to get meaningful signals. 
And we've shown that with each study that we exceed the limits, we do a histology analysis. And we've shown that we don't see any laser related tissue damage, which indicates that we have the potential to increase the limits for this technology. Thank you. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, aside, I guess, to uh, using these devices in practice. Yes. Uh, yeah, um, I think I have a question like, uh, does the segmentation and uh, needle detection deep learning model influence like working in real time for the photoacoustic images does when the you're what? doing the surgery? Say this again, does the what? I mean, does the, the, the deep learning networks for segmentation, so assist, and also uh, to detect the needle tip, like this model works in the real time Yes. When you're doing the surgery? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are able to deliver these networks with the same real-time capability that we can deliver any other um, image method based on beamforming, which is the standard method for delivering ultrasound sonograms in the clinic today. And so um, the inference speed of this network does allow us to deliver real-time images on the order of anywhere from 11 hertz to up to 30 hertz is what we've been able to achieve. So would be would it be like useful to like directly instrument the needle tip with some sensors to improve the tra tracking precise? So, so we do um, attach light sources to the instruments, um, whether it's a needle tip, it's a, whether it's a Da Vinci surgical tool tip or a drill tip, we are attaching light sources so that we can deliver the light as close to the surgical site and see that tool tip in the photoacoustic image in relationship to some structure of interest. But would it help, for instance, uh, to have, uh, maybe not an IMU, but uh, the Da Vinci will have some sensors to detect uh, extension of the probe, right? Uh, so you have very good, uh, look, uh, in the, uh, mm, a very good knowledge of the XYZ location of the tip from the robot itself. Yeah, um, so that's a good point. Like you have, you know, you know that you can record the tracking information of, of the robot. And so you do have some information in that regard as to where the tip is located spatially. But there's also a trade-off and you know, the inverse kinematics and all of the, the, the chain that you have to go through to get that tracking information has a large source of error. And so we've seen error that is as large as, or as small as two millimeters, not much, and, and sometimes larger than that. And our imaging techniques offer uh, more finely sampled information about the true location of the tooltip in relationship to a structure of interest. And I guess if you simply instrument, if you simply use the tracking information, you don't know where the area of interest is precisely. Exactly. So it is of yeah. limited value. Not only do you not know where the area of interest is, but you also don't know where the subsurface area of interest is. So you could, maybe you could use vision to see like what you're able to see with your human eye and what the camera can see, but you don't know what's beneath what the camera can see. And so that's the additional benefit of the imaging. We can get sort of like x-ray vision where we could see through the structures that are not normally transparent to the human eye. Is, is that uh, interest in uh, adding haptics? Oh, uh, that's a great that question. I would, I think, you know, there is certainly potential to add haptics. And I was, you know, thinking that, you know, when I presented that slide about auditory information, right, just like we can process the tool to structure difference and present that difference as in the requested auditory format, we can also present that difference in a haptic feedback sort of format if desired. So the key is that we have the sensing and now there are multiple ways that that sensing can be used to provide feedback to the operator. And haptics is certainly mm -hmm. one of them, just like the visual information by looking at the images is another, and just like the auditory information by hearing the sound is a third option. Uh, I, I want to ask a question uh, more on the machine learning side. So uh, to, to people, let's say, uh, who are used to doing machine learning with RGB images, uh, and ultrasound image looks particularly scary. I don't see anything in that image. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why uh, uh, I expect it to be very difficult to find uh, these 
pattern. So beam forming or spatial coherence will give you some uh, cleaning up of the image as you showed. But isn't it more like finding a needle in a haystack? There are way more. Uh, there are a lot of cues that let's say a clinician would use in order to study a particular uh, sonogram. Uh, the deep network is going to do one of them. It's going to find one feature. How do you think about this? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's absolutely right. If we're building images for a human and the human is using lots of information that we don't even realize we're using in order to come to our conclusion, then I do think that that would be more difficult to build a deep neural network to um, mimic all of the cognitory, like cognitive functions that are going on in our brain when we process images. But um, to counter that, I would say, you know, I took this direction with the goal of building information for automated systems. And we know that we want the automated system to do a particular task. And so I presented the task of say, finding the needle tip. And we can then design networks that are task specific. And in doing this, we know the one output that we care about. And in, in the finding the needle tip example, it's where is the location of the needle tip? We really only need like the coordinates of the needle tip. And then mm -hmm. that could be useful information to guide the robot rather than taking the current pathway of looking at the, uh, creating the image with traditional methods, those Traditional images have artifacts in them. We know, we know why the artifacts exist is because we're creating these mathematical models and making assumptions that are not always true. And so now we have to live with those assumptions that are creating artifacts and then doing some post-processing to the flawed image and getting even more artifacts that are confusing. And then we have to feed that confusing information into our robotic system. So we're taking a different approach and a different pathway that says, well, why not let's just create images that don't have any confusion because we train to specifically output the information, only the information that the robot needs to perform its job. And that's the location of the coordinates, which we realize we can get from the raw data based on the wavefront shape using a deep neural network to figure out all of the other nonlinearities after learning the possible variations that can exist when we have these known variations between patients that are not taken into account when we do our traditional beam forming methods. It's a good segue, I think, for the next question that Ramon may want to ask. Yeah, uh, so I think it's a follow-up follow -up question about the neural network model. So does uh, the trained model uh, robust to the photoacoustic imaging system, which may be provided from different vendors and using different acquisition protocols. Because I know this, uh, this problem uh, is uh, occurred in uh, MR images, but I'm not sure if it has the same case for the ultrasound. Um, that's a great question. So we, um, we do have to take into consideration that different manufacturers apply different type of processing to their data in order to get the image. But what we like about our approach is that we are processing or our input to the network is based on images that are as close to the raw data sensed as possible. So even if there are variations from different manufacturers, it's very unlikely that those variations would have occurred at the level that we're extracting the data. So we're doing it as close, like before any processing has been applied. So you have the variations that may exist from like electronic TGC amplifiers or things like that. But beyond that point, we can consider that the information received by multiple manufacturing systems or from multiple system manufacturers would be more or less the same and certainly have less variation than if we were extracting the information later on in the process after the image has already been formed, after some proprietary filters have been applied, and then we get much more variation that would certainly confuse the networks. That's great. Yeah. Aren't these uh, proprietary uh, uh, filters applied to reduce the variability in, in the source image? To reduce what? The variability of the source image. 
So, I mean, uh, if I were doing some pre-processing, my objectives in these images would naturally be to reduce the intrinsic variability of data. Yeah, so that type of reduction is applied after the data has been collected. Mm -hmm. And so we want to grab that data before any of that processing is applied and train with mm -hmm. that data. Uh, uh, a tiny uh, uh, related question, perhaps. So have you, have you tried to work across ultrasound and photoacoustic data? So train models on one, try to see mm -hmm. if they work on the other ones. Actually, Especially we because uh, of the theorem that you uh, showed at the end, yeah. uh, that there is a clear correlation between how signals would look like in the ultrasound case and the photoacoustic case, and you understand some part of the mathematics behind them. Yeah, I love that question. Um, so we actually did try that, you know, we, we trained these, like if I go back to the coherent slide, right? Let me bring up what I'm talking about to give you a visual. So yeah, so this one, right? We trained this uh, coherent architecture to, to learn the spatial coherence function, right? We input the raw, in this case, it was ultrasound data and we output a coherence function. And we did exactly what you just did, what you just requested. Like, can we input raw photoacoustic data into the same network and output a coherence function? But we were not successful because the ultrasound data is significantly more complicated than the photoacoustic data. So basically we're saying, can we give, we give the network, we train the network with something that looks like this and say, create a coherence function. And then we said, now take something that looks so simplistic like this and give me a coherence function. It was not able to do that. So I interpret that to mean that we need to train on the actual data that the network would see. And just like you wouldn't expect going from simple to something complicated like this would work, it doesn't work the other way around either. It's got something so complicated as this then something simple like that the network was not able to handle it. Thank you. I see maybe uh, another question that you mentioned about the, you use some uh, simulation based method to, to create data for training. Can you talk more about that? So is that like physical model based simulation process? Or, yeah, I can yeah. talk more about that. So that's actually the heart of both of our um, deep learning approaches, whether it's ultrasound or photoacoustic imaging. And so um, here are some great example. I didn't get to show this slide, but so what we do is we have like multiple um, parameters that we can vary, noise being one of them. So we can vary like the level of channel noise available and we can measure the performance of our network in terms of classification accuracy of the sources and artifacts. And we see that, you know, with more and more noise, uh, the classification accuracy first stays fairly same to the noiseless case. And what's remarkable about this result is that for this negative 15 dB case, we have fairly high accuracy up to about 80% or so for detecting sources and artifacts. But then when we look at the channel data, you and I, we can't see where these sources and artifacts are located. So that was actually very remarkable that the network was able to even produce something. But then when you get much higher than that, the accuracy uh, plummets and we start to get more missed sources and missed artifacts, which are shown in shades of yellow. And then similarly, we can look at, you know, our location error for finding the 2D coordinates of the, the, the source, the source of the wavefront. And in order to, uh, train this network, we have noise variations, but we also have other parameters that were varied, such as the speed of sound, uh, the density, the number of sources and artifacts. And then uh, through this process, we were able to get networks that contain lots of different variations and allow us to then confidently test those networks on real data. Thanks. To, uh, to ask a follow-up question on that, uh, mm -hmm. the image that you showed, would a clinician be able to do something with it? The, uh, Which negative one? 15 dB, uh, the negative 15 dB noise. Ah, so. Uh, like uh, SNR. Yeah, no, I mean, so all of these images are images that came from like a, I would say, you know, they came from the channel data, which is, the data that you know none of us can do something with 
because uh, it, it traditionally would have to be beam formed first. Okay. And so um, the remarkable thing about the channel data result is that, you know, you would think that if you and I can't see the wavefront, then how can any, any other method based on that noisy data find the signal? And so um, even if we could see the wavefront though, that's not enough information for us to use it to make an image. Yes. But, uh, and to ask a, a more refined version of the same question, uh, how do you validate these results? So, I mean, uh, it's very easy to overfit with mm, deep networks. Yeah. Uh, and particularly when you don't have, uh, um, we have limited ground truth. Mm -hmm. So our validation, I mean, it comes from a series of things. One is, you know, standard looking at your loss functions, right? Making sure you're not overfitting. A second is we are training in simulations. We're training with simulations that mimic the physics of wave propagation. So we have um, ground truth just built in our simulations. So if you know we deviate from what our simulations tell us should happen, then we know that we have a bad network. And the nice thing about the simulation is that we can train it on these multiple possible variations, but because you know there is essentially an infinite number of variations that can exist, we can create another simulation that the network has not seen before and then train it that way to ensure that we are robust. Um, that's another thing. A third thing is, you know, we can generally have a sense of, you know, the manual version of the task, even if we're not so, so stepping away from simulations, if we start to use real data. We have a general sense of how we can segment a structure manually. And we can always check like the output result based on what we would do manually. It's just more time consuming and we don't have the same inference speed as a network would. So we have that check built in as well. And the uh, other check is that, you know, there's always a way to introduce new data that has not been seen before, whether it's just collecting new data, whether it's just going to a different patient, because we are all very unique and produce, you know, similar images, but also different enough to challenge the network with regard to small perturbations and ensuring that those smaller, those small perturbations do not cause the network to break down and produce a significantly different result from what we got with a different patient. Uh, uh, I would like to ask a concluding question uh, yeah. that's a little broader. Um, I mean, uh, when I see your work, it is uh, a very interesting uh, line between developing new hardware uh, for getting better signals out and uh, doing data-based methods, data-driven methods to eke out more uh, signals from the old data or this new data. So where would you invest uh, let's say if you had one unit of effort, where would you put uh, it uh, in? Should are we limited by algorithms that can handle this kind of data, or are we limited, or do you see fundamentally new uh, hardware, sensing hardware, to give you different data, especially let's say for one uh, one of on one of these applications that you were considering? Yeah, I think that you know we need both. I you know would say that the two are synergistic. Sometimes one lags the other. And so, you know, we may be at a phase, uh, you know, at a point in time where we have exhausted the capabilities of the hardware based on what's available to us today. And so we need to turn our direction to software innovations. But I don't think that we've exhausted the possibility of what's uh, available for the future just yet. So if I can expand on this, one concept that I have in mind is, you know, flexible arrays. Up until now, all of our sensing technology has been rigid. And I think, you know, with our flexible electronics available and with some people working on flexible sensors, I think we have the same potential to translate that to ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging systems. But with that potential and with that translation, we introduce new software challenges because we still have to do beamforming or some combination of beamforming and possibly deep learning in order to produce the image because the sensor data alone is not enough to guide the surgeon. And so with the introduction of a flexible hardware, 
we now create new challenges for software to determine the best method to create images based on a flexible array when traditionally we're used to these more rigid arrays for creating images. That, that is a very interesting uh, future. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for answering all our questions. Uh, I hope uh, the audience enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. Um, uh, and I will let Gabby take it from here. Yes, thank you again for having me. And I'm looking at the uh, the participant list and I see Neeraj. I don't know if it's the same Neeraj, but I would like to give a shout out to him because he's one of the people on this slide, if that's him, who has helped with our DaVinci integration and photoacoustic image. Thank you again for having me. Great, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, please tune in next Friday, March 5th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next Grassman Robotics speaker, Dr. Timothy Chung from DARPA. For more information on this and upcoming events, be sure to follow us on social media or check our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. At this point, if Grass Bees wants